Joshua's family struggled to survive. The 10-year-old boy longed to go to the local Seventh-day Adventist school, but his parents couldn't afford to send him. One day, Joshua and his parents went to the local market. On their way, they passed the Adventist school. Joshua heard the children singing during their morning assembly. He longed to join them, wear the uniform they were wearing, carry the books they were carrying, and most of all, sing the songs they were singing. Joshua's father saw his sad expression and went inside to talk to the teacher. Together, they went to the pastor's office. The teacher explained to the pastor that Joshua's parents wanted to send him to the school, but couldn't afford it. The pastor promised to talk to the school principal. Then the pastor, teacher, and Joshua's father prayed together. Joshua's father prayed for Joshua to be admitted to the school. The pastor was impressed with the man's faith and assured him that God answers prayers of faith. God answered the father's prayer that day. Today, Joshua is the happiest child. He wears his uniform proudly and joins the other children singing loudly and happily. The school principal found a sponsor for him, so his parents didn't have to worry about tuition. Joshua is studying hard and hopes to become a pastor when he grows up. I thank God because now I'm part of this school and I learn more about this Jesus from the school. The Seventh-day Adventist High School, Aurangabad, was started in 1989 to provide education to children from all sections of society around the campus. We have at present 202 children, and out of that, only 10 are Seventh-day Adventists. This school is a very special school because when the children are here, they are taught the love of Jesus. As soon as they come to the school, we make sure that they are come for the assembly, they have the worship, they are surrounded with uh, a lot of values that are from the Bible. This is how our school is a little unique than the others. Unfortunately, after 34 years of service, there are improvements that must be made to enhance the students' learning and safety. They lack a library and laboratory and have to travel to another school to access those facilities. Because the school has only six classrooms, they have to divide the students into two shifts in order to accommodate all 202 children. The school needs to install a water filter for drinking water and replace rickety furniture that could be hazardous. Because of uh, the infrastructure of our school, many of the children, many of the parents don't want to admit their children here. They want to, they, they always are attracted to better schools than this. But once our school comes up, I've, I'm so much uh, assured with the help of God that many of the children will come here and know the love of God. A portion of your 13th Sabbath offering will help provide the required facilities for the Seventh-day Adventist English High School in Aurangabad, India. So we want you to pray, uh, remember them in your prayers uh, so that uh, many children can get good education. That is a true education uh, from the school like our uh, school here in uh, North Maharashtra section. Thank you for supporting Mission Offerings.
What's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of Junior PowerPoint Sabbath School with Friends. This lesson is lesson four, and the title is Way to Worship. Psalms 100, verse 4. It says, Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. Our PowerPoint is, when we take an active part in worship, we are responding to God's love. Let us look at our Bible lesson at a glance. On Sabbath, in Capernaum, as is his custom, Jesus teaches in church. The people are amazed at his teaching. He is believable. He knows what he is talking about. He makes good sense. Jesus shows that it is important to attend church and contribute to the church worship. The story also tells us that evil cannot exist where Jesus is. When we focus on Jesus, Satan is driven away. This is a lesson about worship. Jesus set an example of being involved in corporate worship, coming together publicly to praise God for his great love. Worship is a verb. Now I'd like to invite my fellow companions on the program. We have our co-hostess, Kezia and Marcia. We have Nathaniel. And we have a new person today. She's coming from the country of Uganda. It is Zion Victoria. So I'm just going to call her Zion for this program. So thank you all for being here with me and for all coming together on this program. Let's get into the questions now. Question one. What does the memory verse and PowerPoint say about worship? Or what do you understand from the memory verse and the PowerPoint about worship? Let me repeat the memory verse again. Psalm 100 and verse 4. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. And the PowerPoint is, when we take an active part in worship, we are responding to God's love. Question is, what does the memory verse and PowerPoint say about worship? Happy Sabbath, so I'll go first. Um, this, the, the Sabbath school, um, this week's power tax, um, it basically means to me, it's like a call to worship and it's like to give thanks to God. And basically I understand it to me, like to get into the gates of heaven, we have to be giving thanks. And by praising him, it brings us into the courtroom of the King of Kings. And also this verse kind of encourages us to enter God's presence with thanksgiving, praise, and recognizing him as good and faithful. And I know like there's like no way that you can go into worship um, with like a bad attitude or just like a pessimistic attitude where like you don't want to be here. And that's not like full worship. That's not genuine worship and praise and thanksgiving. So that's what I understand it to mean. And then our uh, PowerPoint talking about um, being active in worship is a, is a way of give, showing, showing God's love or something like that, I believe. Yeah, responding to God's love. So I think when you actively sing, if you're singing songs in church, you actively doing that is like kind of like your communication to God, saying that you appreciate this, what he's doing in your life. And because the words of the song are majority of the times, well, they are worshiping him and praising him and thanking him for all that he's done for us. That's your way of like speaking to him. So that's what I take from that. Uh, happy Sabbath, everyone. What I gather from the power text and the PowerPoint is that when we come to worship God, we are giving him our thanks. We are giving him our praise for everything that we, for everything that he has done for us. And through that, that is our response to his love. So when we come into the temple or the tabernacle, not only meditating on his word or reading the scriptures like Jesus did in this um, this 
sorry, but we also can show and worship God through our praise and thanking him and showing adoration for all that he's done and for his love towards us. Happy Sabbath, happy Sabbath, everyone. Um, what I gather from this is kind of what KD said, how whenever we worship worship God, we shouldn't have like a bad mindset or attitude, as she says, because it's not showing reverence to God. We must give God all the honor, all the praise, and that's what I take from the story. Oh God, we must give him all the power, all the glory, all our all of our attention, all of our reverence. Be very respectful of me when we praise him, and that's what I get from the story. Well, hello everyone, happy Sabbath. Um, our power text says, Enter his gifts with thanksgiving and his courts with praise, give thanks to him and praise his name. So, what I basically understand about this is, um Giving praise to God is all about giving thanks to him because you can praise somebody if you're not contented. So what I think is giving thanks to him where it it's 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 a gesture of of of, of showing it's it's giving praise to him works hand in hand with with praising him. Otherwise you can't praise somebody if you're not contented. Um, with it and content results into thanksgiving and then our memory verse our memory verse comes from our memory verse was talking also about thanksgiving so in this process of worship it shows that it is really important to to give thanks to god that worship walks hand in hand again with giving thanks to him because when we come to worship to God, we are acknowledging his power. And, and on top of acknowledging his power, we need to give thanks to him so that, um, so that how can I express this? The moment we give thanks to God, it will, it will persuade us to, to worship him and to do the things that they recommend us to do while worshiping. So that's what I understand. Thank you for all your answers. I believe they are all right in their own way because this these the power text and the PowerPoint both have to do with worshiping God and thanksgiving with God. And I also wanted to show how both of them line up as to it talks about in the power text, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. So to me, that's giving reference to his gates, his courts, when we are coming to his room, which equals to when we are in his presence. A lot of people go to God in his go to his presence and you know, cussing out saying, why not get this? Why haven't I gotten that? And so forth. But it says in the verse to enter his presence with thanksgiving and praise. Even if you didn't get what you wanted, you still give thanks to him and praise his name. And in the PowerPoint, it talks about when we take an active part in worship. A lot of people don't take an active part in worship. Like you are there physically, but you're not there spiritually. So it also talks about taking an active part of worship and how if like people would say, oh, I love God, I love God, but they don't worship him. They don't take an active part in worship. It says when we take an active part in worship, we are responding to God's love. So from that, it just reminds us that we should put our effort in worship and show our effort in worship. And it shows how much we love God. Actions speak louder than words. That's what I get from this. Okay. I just want to add something else. I really love how um, Joshua, he gave emphasis on entering into his gates and entering into his courts because when we are worshiping God, we're entering into his presence. And when we enter his presence, 
God doesn't owe us anything, so the least we, we should give him, or we can give him, we can't give God anything but praise. At least that's the thing that can measure up to, not even measure up, but praise can do. But what I want to say is when we enter into God's presence, the least we can do is be thankful and show praise for all his wonderful work. So I really love that Joshua gave emphasis on the entering into God's presence and entering into his cotton with praise. Thank you, Marcia. Time for question two. What does the Bible story for this week's lesson teach you about Jesus' character and how it affects the persons or the things or whatever is around him? So I repeat, what does this story teach you about Jesus' character? I'll go first. The thing I saw, I mean, it states it inside the scripture, but it shows that Jesus, he has authority and also that he does not play. And even when, and I believe he have like the courage, because I believe this was at the start of his ministry when he was reading Isaiah and then they wanted to throw him off the temple. Of course, God would have known that they would have they would have gone to do that because he's um omnis omniscient uh that word but also that he had authority and i would love to reach that point where you command anything you rebuke the devil and whatever he wants and all the negative forces he has against you but in this character i see that jesus he was very authoritative and he had courage, of course he had courage because he's God. And yeah, he is very, he doesn't play, uh, he's very respectful about God's worship. That's what I saw. Very happy Sam. So I just like to say how uh, in the story I see how Jesus he did he had a big influence on a lot of people. People were going from town to town following him because of what he had to say. Because Jesus was a really big, big, big thing back then. From town to town, people really wanted to hear. We really wanted to listen to what he was going to say next. And Jesus' character, I like to say, he was very, he was very helpful and forgiving. Because when the man came to him, when the man came to him, when the demon was inside him, he cured him without question. It shows how much God loved us. Well, what I learned from Jesus is, well, he was preaching to the people, but his, his, his message was of action. When he was preaching, he made sure that, that he preaches with action, that when he preaches about love, he shows love by healing people, by um, welcoming the sinners that people were segregating. So I think that since his preaching was of action, that's why people were eager to hear from what he were, the, were uh, they were eager to hear what he was saying because he was teaching about love and he was showing love to people. He was teaching about truth and he was show he was truthful to people. So I think that if we implement that action action preaching and ministry, people will hear us. If you're if you're telling people that hey, stop being a thief. And if you're a thief in that village, it means that it should start from you. Stop stealing and people will see the light from you. If you're like, hey, dress properly, let it start from you. Dress decently and people will be eager to hear. So that's my contribution. I completely agree with everyone. <clears throat> There's so many things that we can learn from Jesus overall. But this um, <clears throat> this little excerpt of his life, you can learn so much. Firstly, <clears throat> I learned that he's very influential. He had hundreds of people just eager to listen to him, to hear from him, not only in Capernaum, but all over wherever he went. 
and people would just be eager to hear about him and persons would go and share that oh he's this here do you want to hear him with me or like they'll all go together and watch and just listen to what he had to say persons were eager and I also learned that he's authoritative authoritative I think that's the word I used to pronounce it but though there's I don't know if you guys have ever heard the song or the hymn like It's sim it sounds it says the winds and the waves obey his voice. And so like the winds and the waves, nature obeys him, but demons even know his name, demons even fear, demons tremble at the sound of um Jesus or like hearing him or seeing him. So that just shows how much power he has over the demonic realm, even though he is Jesus and although he's light and he has power he has power over the demonic um spirits and stuff like that and i also learned that he's very um he's kind as well he showed love like zion mentioned he was preaching about love and he showed love because the sanhedrin council or those pharisees they would never in a million years touch somebody who has a demonic spirit or um come in contact with somebody who's a leopard, but Jesus did that several and countless amount of times. And I also learned that he's very humble because maybe in this story, they missed that piece. Maybe they didn't go into depth, but the way it looked like to me, he just silenced um, the demon. He took the demon out and then he just went straight back into teaching. He didn't um, like relish in all the glory and all everybody saying, oh my gosh, look at Jesus. He's like, oh, me. You know, he wasn't like that. He just continued teaching and he did what he had to do. He was not um, boastful and proud. And I think like when they say, what would Jesus do in a situation like that? You have to look at it and say like, you would have to want to, you would want to have all of those qualities, being humble, being influential, where when you open your mouth, persons listen to you when they're eager to hear what you have to say, because you're setting an example, like Zion mentioned. Those are very good answers from all of you. Um, you guys all looked at this story at your own unique, different way. And I really like that. So, guys, basically, you guys all collectively said what I was going to say. Because, so Jesus was talking to the people. He, he led by example. Just like how I said earlier that actions speak louder than words. And how even, even though he knew that the Sanhedrin didn't like what he was doing, he still continued doing it because he knew it was the right thing to do. Same way that even though society doesn't think we're doing the right thing, we still know that it is the right thing to do and we still continue doing it. And that Jesus... His character, he always wanted the best for everybody. It's not like he fav had favoritism to this person. He wanted the best for everybody. And everything that he does is for the best of his, for his mission, for that person's journey, and for the people around him, the people that will be changed through him, the person that will be inspired through him. It is all to help their journey. So, and also on the last part about the man that was demon possessed, the fact that Jesus had compassion over this man said something to me that, look, this man actually does care for people and that not even demons can stop him. Nothing's going to stop him. Nothing can stop him. Okay. So that is the end of my answer. I'm going to go to the next question. Imagine you were there in the Bible story as it happened. What emotions or how would you feel during that story? I'll say, I'll say the question again. Imagine you were there in the Bible story as it happened. What emotions or how would you feel or what would you imagine would have happened around you during that story?
Well, I can go first. I think in that story <clears throat> surrounding me, I could imagine everyone is just like quiet and just waiting for that moment to see like what this is going to do because this supposedly crazy man or this person who is demon possessed is approaching all of us and he is screaming and carrying on. So like, what is the son of God going to do? What is he going to do? Is he going to cower and he's going to run away? Or is he going to remove this demon and just move on? And I could also imagine the Pharisees in the background, you know, because they were just waiting on Jesus to just do something so that they could just take him away or deal with him. So I can imagine they're taking notes and they're waiting to see what happens. And like for myself, I think I would just be glued to see what happens. But also I'd be a little shaken up because there's somebody who's demon possessed literally here. So I'd have been a little scared, but I would be glued and like eager to see what would happen next. What's going to go on? Is this man going to be like, normal back to normal again what's gonna happen what's Steve's gonna do so that would be my mindset that's what I think would happen around me and like yeah yeah, yeah so. um for me I'll take like a realistic standpoint knowing how I am now and as we are told in this in the scripture that there'll be a lot of people I know that I would be quite claustrophobic and knowing all the things that Jesus has previously done, I'd be eager to like get in the front to see it instead of, and I'm quite short. So if there's other people in the front of me, I'll probably be hopping up, hopping up, trying to see what Jesus is going to be doing. And in the passage, I know they did it like from a narrative view or response. And they said that there was a scream. I mean, in the PowerPoint story, they said it was a scream. But if there was like a scream and then this little ravish or this wild man just came running, of course, I'd be shocked. But at the same time, me knowing who I am, because I know back then they weren't really too hot up for what Jesus was teaching. But if I was one of the people who started to believe back then, then I'll be calm in my heart, like, okay, I know Jesus has this. I know based on what he said previously, he has the authority to do this. And as he, if he says he's the son of God, I saw he has this, he has this handle. At the same time, that's all the things that I felt I would be experiencing back then. From a realistic standpoint, knowing who I am now. But at the same time, I'll be enjoying the experience. And I think I'll be grateful for the experience also. Well, my emotion would be assurance. I would be assured that the person preaching really, like I would get assurance because if he chest away demons and a man, then I would know that, hey, um, this person who's really telling me what to do really has the authority and power for me to follow what he's saying because you know by faith we live we live by faith because what we read in the bible some things in in common life are really impossible to happen but by faith we believe but if i'm to imagine by those days the way people were i would really take long to to grasp what jesus is saying if i hadn't seen what he had done for that man but the moment i would see that hey he chased away demons and that man and and he has authority over them then i would really take what he's saying seriously so that's the assurance i'm talking about um uh, all right i would just say like i would i would really be invested with him because i think i think it's crazy man coming from jesus and i'm thinking well is he going to heal him i mean it looks crazy, but, but, but what what is God gonna do? I'm like, what is Jesus gonna do? As Katie said, I will be glued to my feet, just watching the whole thing, but at the same time a little startled, like like what's he gonna do? Uh but I uh, but I would be very invested in Jesus. Like I would go from go with it from town to town, try to listen to what he's saying, because he knows everything and anything that he said is probably might be the most important thing that I'm ever gonna hear in my life. Well, that's what I feel like. Uh, 
those are all great answers. Um, I was just thinking about my answer. I was thinking, okay, so I'm with my dad, right? I'm sitting down in a nice seat. I don't even know if the ground is sitting on, but I'm sitting down. I'm, I'm listening to Jesus. And as my heart is filling up with hope and compassion, I just hear this madman saying, ah! in the back of the, in the, the church, as there's running in. First of all, I'm running out. He's running in, I'm running out. But for the sake of the imagination, I'm going to act as if I did not run out. Okay, I'm glued to my seat, as the, the story says. And I, I'll, prob I'll, probably, I'll probably either have two options. I close my eyes. I keep them open. I probably close my eyes. But I'm going to keep my eyes open. And I'm going to see, because in that moment, I'll say, okay, he's, after, he's going to Jesus. If uh, it feels like a little baby there, he'll probably say, oh, he's just going to Jesus like the rest of us. Because at the end of the day, we're all going to Jesus for the same thing, hope, assurance, and to be set free. So we're all going to Jesus for the same thing. So I'll, in that moment, I'll probably be like, we, we don't want this guy in the room. But at the same time, it would be wrong to take him out the room because he's looking for the same thing we're all looking for. So it's like you're between a stone and a hard rock. Or is it the other way? A rock and a hard stone. But it's hard to decipher what to do in that moment. And I'm thankful that the, that the way that happened in the Bible is what actually happened. Because... Just like how there's a struggle between us keeping him in the room or telling him to get out the room, it's the same struggle within him because remember he's demon possessed. So it's the same struggle that he is going through, struggle between good and evil. And remember, we're all having that struggle on day-to-day -day life. It may not be as strong, but there is that struggle there. Okay, I am going to go on. To, I believe is our last question. What was the most interesting part of the story? I'll repeat. What is the most interesting part of this week's story? Well, for me, the most interesting part of the story is when he, when he, um, when, 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 it was when he healed the man. It was when he healed the, the crazy man. Like seeing this crazy person just walk up, just walk up screaming, yelling, and everything, and just seeing God, just seeing she's not even scared. He just, all he didn't feel any fear. He just felt, he just felt empathy, compassion for him. He felt bad for him, so he healed him. Like really showed out she, she's his character. It shows how like he is not afraid. He just wants to help people, and the Pharisees did not see, and the Pharisees did not see that. All they saw was. Oh, we need a reason to arrest this man. Um, for me, no matter how much times I read it, and I don't know why it is interesting to me, and I can't lie that I don't find it interesting, is that every time um, in the scripture it said that the people were so amazed at the authority that Jesus have. I don't know why it's so interesting or I'm so intrigued by it because at the same time <laughs> those same people <laughs> were saying crucify him, crucify him at the cross. But I can't really condemn them because even in our modern day life we um we do that. And also another thing that I found interesting was that I mean I know the answer to it now, but when Jesus tells the demon to hold thy peace and come out of the man, in religious studies we learned that the reason why Jesus didn't tell he didn't allow the demon to keep on speaking about who he was was because 
His time had not come for him to reveal who he was as the son of God. So he's like, Shh, put a put a hole on that, put a gauge on that, and be quiet. My time has not come, you little demon. My time has not come, so you have to keep hush hush about that. But other than that, those were the two things that I found intriguing and interesting about the story. Before anybody answer, sorry. In retrospect, I'm thinking about my answer just now, and I know Kitty just mentioned it. But like they told us before, that this was basically like the start of Jesus's ministry. And even when he was in the temple and um, when he's um, reading the book, they was wondering, oh, isn't that jo um, Joseph the carpenter's son? So thinking about it now, it would make sense that they were amazed that a demon had, that Jesus had so much authority because they didn't really know who he was. So I understand that now. Um, I'm glad the Holy Spirit revealed to me, revealed that to me just now. But yeah. Well, the interesting part for me is where the demons say that we know you, God. Like, hey, even Satan knows God, even the demons know God. So it was interesting for me that they acknowledged, the demons acknowledged God's presence and, and they showed that they were uncomfortable by it. That was interesting. And another interesting part is that Jesus didn't shudder or freak or show any any emotion of being scared or anything. Instead, he he showed a loving. He, he frowned. The thing shows he frowned and he commanded the demons to go away. So, the interesting part is his authority and 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 the the acknowledgement the demons gave him. That's what I find interesting about the story. And as far as God's ministry, since it was his first time starting it was his commencing of ministry we see that it caused for it's a call for 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 let me how can i say it? it's a call for for acknowledgement like he's calling he he's bringing house to order to show them that hey my ministry is starting and i have the authority i have the power so god was displaying a lot of things to people in his in his ministry when he was starting his ministry I love all of your answers. You guys all look at the different ways, which I really like. I really like the diversity of how different people view, even if it's the same subject. What I saw most interesting was Jesus' influence and how he reached out to everybody. He didn't just reach out to select through to show that his mission is and was for everybody. So the way that he, the influence that he had that so much people wanted to see him and the influence that he had with the Sanhedrin, every single day I wondered to myself, was the influence that he had in the Sanhedrin good or bad? Because it's, well, I believe it is good because it showed the Sanhedrin that, look, we are not all that and we have some work to do. We have things that need to improve and there is room for improvement. So his influence to people around him and how he interacted with other people was, I believe, the most interesting thing to me and the thing that intrigued me the most. Okay. That is the end of my questions. I will now hand over to Kezia. Thank you so much for answering the question. Thank you so much, Sasha, for those questions. I completely enjoyed them. They had us thinking and had us really understanding what it meant to be in that um that situation in that position that those persons were in, and also what Jesus's position was. And how he dealt with it and how he maneuvered through that situation. So thank you so much, Joshua, for those questions. I really did enjoy them. And I'm sure that everyone else did. So PowerPointers, 
we actually want to apologize. It's been, I think, about six weeks, five weeks since we have posted or recorded or done anything. We haven't even told you guys Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, nothing. So on behalf of PowerPoint Tower School with Friends team, we apologize for that. And we hope that that doesn't happen again. Or if it does, not for that long of a hiatus. So, yes. And then also... Merry Christmas and Happy New Year because we weren't able to say that before. We hope you guys had a great season of holidays and food and family and friends. And also, we hope that you guys had a prosperous new year and that this year brings you more joy and blessings. And even if it brings you heartache, just know that there's better ahead. Um, That is all. Well, okay. I have some more announcements. So happy birthday to all the January babies. We wish you many, many more. Marcia, you are a January baby or a February baby? February? A January baby. January baby. So Marcia's birthday is this month. So I hope she's celebrating from January 1st straight till the 31st. I hope that's what's going on. Um, so happy birthday, Marcia, in advance, because we're going to say happy birthday next week, but happy birthday in advance, and to everyone else who is celebrating in January. Also coming up next, we have Uncle Pastor DJ with our 20 grades and lesson recap. We have Auntie Ida May with our health journey and our special feature at the end. And we also want to say thank you to Uncle PJ for our PowerPoint recap. So that is all. Oh, I also want to remind our PowerPoint is in this new 2024, please subscribe. If you have not subscribed already, please subscribe because, I mean, it's the new year. Your new year resolution should be to subscribe and stay tuned. Thank you very much. And also, we want to say thank you to those who have followed their resolutions and subscribed. Thank you to the 1,720 subscribers who have clicked that little button and stayed tuned. So thank you very much. And we hope to see many more persons following us on our journey with Christ. And we hope that, they, that you all stay encouraged through us. And um, that is all. We're going to pray and then we're going to say goodbye. So can Zion please pray for us? Let's humble ourselves for a word of prayer. Kind and precious, loving Father in heaven, we thank you for the gift of life. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your love that you showed to us now and then. We pray that you be with us and guide us throughout our days of our lives. And we pray that what we learn here, let us implement it in our lives so that it can work in us, so that we can be better people and we can project your your name so that others can know you help us to be good people to others let us have your love let us have your extraordinary character so that you can draw more people to you help us so that we can walk in your footsteps help us so that you can have the urge to read the bible now and then in jesus's name of prayed amen amen thank you zion for that prayer once again, thank you, Zion, for joining us all the way from Uganda. We hope that you join us again or maybe even some more. Thank you, Joshua, for the questions. Thank you, Marcia and Nathaniel for joining us on the program today. And thank you, PowerPointers, for staying to the very end of the discussion. Don't forget to stay tuned for what's next. And we will see you all next week. Happy Sabbath and adios. Bye. The Sabbath day is still a holy day. Hello, my PowerPoint. This is Pastor DJ with What We Believe. Phenomenal belief number 20th speaks of the Sabbath. As Seventh-day Adventists, we believe that the Sabbath day is of the Lord. The Sabbath day is still a holy day. A day of rest, renewal, spiritual renewal, a day of reflection when we take and have more time to reflect on the goodness of God, to reflect on his creative works. We believe that he created the, the whole world, the heavens, 
the earth and the seas. And so to you all my power porters, let us remember that the Sabbath day is still a holy day. At sunset on Friday, it begins and it ends at sunset on Saturday. Beloved, power porters, let us remember the Sabbath day. May God bless you and enjoy this wonderful Sabbath. Imagine seeing a creature that has three hearts, nine brains, and blue blood. What do you think you're looking at? Well, an octopus, of course! Two of the hearts pump blood to its gills, while the third pumps blood to the organs. Crazy enough, this third heart stops beating when an octopus swims. That's why they prefer to walk across the sea bottom. It's much less exhausting. An octopus also has neurons in each of its eight arms, meaning that in addition to its primary brain, each arm has a mind of its own. The blue color of its blood comes from something called hemocyanin, which helps an octopus breathe better in the cold ocean. An octopus is also known for its powerful ink squirting jet propulsion system. When threatened, the rapid release of ink clouds the water and confuses its attacker, giving it time to flee to safety. Another safety device that an octopus has is its incredible ability to camouflage itself. Their skin can not only change color, but it can also change patterns to blend in with its environment. Just another one of God's Amazing Animals!